Thank you so much, sir. Um, I feel extremely honored to introduce the distinguished guest speaker, Mr. Minhaj Rahman, the CEO and founder of CIDA Solutions, an AI-enabled academic and industry research agency. The focus on the research agency is on psychographic profiling and value generation through machine learning and deep learning. Data-driven decisions for executives is increasingly becoming a complicated puzzle. And without reliable modeling and reality testing, such decisions can become deal breakers. CIDA uses behavioral insights from consumer and market data to elicit insights that gives companies a unique advantage over its competitors. We generate info, they generate infographics, research reports, white papers, and actionable insights for executives to make informed decisions about their next moves. Mr. Minhaj Rahman has served in different universities as guest and visiting professor and is frequently invited to give training programs and lecturers on advanced research problems in qualitative as well as quantitative research. His students include researchers from medicine, engineering, social sciences, and commerce and have left raving reviews about his unusual teaching methods and unconventional approaches to education. His top to bottom approach to pedagogy resonates with his audience and has gotten him applause from his intellectual papers. Minhaj's research interests include psychometrics, personality, psychology, and its applications for education businesses using machine learning and deep neural network learning. On behalf of School of Systems and Technology, UMT, I'm very delighted to have him with us today in order to share his insights about the topic titled as Psychographic Profiling for Customer Segmentation with Big Data and Deep Learning. Respected Sir Minhaj, I would like you to take over the session, please. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mazur, for inviting me. Um, also, IEEE Chairman, Dr. Amjad, as well as the FIFA administration of UMT um, and IEEE organization for organizing events. It's a pleasure to be here. And I really wish I could be at um, UMT hall or auditorium at the moment, but um, unfortunately that's not possible for this um, point, but I'd really like to meet you um, in person and interact with um, a lot of you and uh, exchange ideas. Um, but with that said, um, let's get started um, with the presentation today. Now, for the next 30 minutes, my goal is to share with you some of the most complicated science behind artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning through storytelling, real examples, anecdotes and groundbreaking discoveries of our times. What I'm trying to do is trying to make it simple, inspiring and easy for you to understand the whole process without getting into complicated maths. Now, before I get into that, a brief introduction of where I come from, um, what I've been doing. Um, I studied for a postgraduate program um, in management sciences in a small town in Sweden. Um, it was in the northern Sweden where it gets really, really cold, uh, about minus 25, minus 30. Um, so you have these polar nights um, with um, a lot of interesting opportunities. Um, you have these dog sludges that you can actually ride uh, not very far from the city where I live. Um, you can also see Aurora Borealis, and a fun fact is that um, um, last year, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to um, some of the work that was done in Nomi University by a researcher called Emmanuel Charpentier. And she was working like only five minutes away from me in another block. So that was the closest that I've been to um, a Nobel Prize winner. Um, afterwards, I've been working with different Fortune 500 companies Telenor, Ericsson, Microsoft, 
Um, our company is also uh, partners with Microsoft in Pakistan as well. We have been partners before with IBM. We are currently partners with Adobe. I'm also Pakistan's only certified um, R Studio consultant. Um, we are also partners with Max Studio, which is a qualitative software uh, for writing qualitative um, research papers um, and Viva as well and IBM SPSS. I also have a YouTube podcast called the Minhaj Podcast. It's one of the most um, favorite podcasts in data science. Um, you have uh, It's also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Um, some of the world leading voices in data science and AI have been my guests um, recently. I have had director of data science, um, Lisa Cohen um, of Twitter, who was on the show. Um, I also had the pleasure of having um, vice president of Gartner, which is world's finest research um, company, Doug Douglas Laney. And we also had the memory champion, three-time memory champion actually um, from Germany um, and a very fine sleep researcher and neuroscientist, Boris Conrad. And I have other um, neuroscientists and psychologists and, um, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and CIO writers as my guests on the show. Um, so feel free to actually go and check out the YouTube channel. You'll really find it very interesting. Um, as for my work, um, my research papers, uh, my articles, memos, presentations are on my research get account. It's been read vastly throughout the globe, over 17,000 reads. I'm also author of three books. Um, I also have have translated a lot of psychometric instruments from English into Urdu, um, done the reliability tests, um, tests like Neo IP, IP 300. It's, it's a very famous free version of big five personality test and also an exact one. Um, I'm also an influencer on LinkedIn um, in AI data science psychology with over 20,000 followers, um, do a lot of mentorship, startup advisory um, and advisory board um, work. And I'm also, you know, um, a freaking guest on different podcasts. And Data Professor is one of the famous channels um, on YouTube on data science. I've been a guest um, on that podcast, as well as Joe Rice's podcast and different other places. I've, I've been doing visiting and guest lectures, um, not an, as much as I would like to do anymore, but I used to um, teach different courses in university, which was one of the favorite parts, um, getting to talk to students, you know, teaching them. Um, learning from them. And I also write op-ed and articles in different newspapers. Now, how am I going to teach today is the important question rather than what I'm going to teach, because you're probably going to find what I'm going to teach you online anyways. But how you teach is very important to me at least, and it has served um, quite a deeper purpose in my life. Um, and what I would use is called something um, it's called Feynman Technique. Um, Richard Phillips Feynman was uh, an American theoretical physicist and who also received the Nobel Prize in 1965, if you don't already know him. And more than his Nobel Prize, he's actually known for breaking down very complicated concepts into simple linear concepts. And what he did was that he used a pictorial representation scheme for the mathematical expressions describing the behavior of subatomic particles, um, which later became as Feynman diagrams. So his greatest achievement, however, was the love of his students for him that he earned through making learning fun and digestible. And for most part of my life, I followed this mantra um, myself, and I'm glad to inform you that it's a very good recipe to become popular among your students. Um, and in today's lecture, I'll try to keep that um, fun um, during the presentation and keep the maths out um, of the presentation and talk about interesting um, and interactive stories and anecdotes um, and recent developments that hopefully will inspire you to learn more about data science and AI. So what's the game plan for today? I have broken down the presentation into four parts. Um, easily digestible four parts that we're going to be recapping at the end of every present um, every section of the presentation. So the first one would be the machine learning and AI, what it is. So before we actually go ahead and start something, we need to be very clear about the definitions of the thing that we're going to be talking about. So once we have our terminology 
all set together, we can move on to the machine learning concepts. So that's where we'll be talking about um, what actually it means um, to be teaching a machine how to learn. And then we're going to get into a specific type of machine learning, which is called neural networks that is inspired from human brain and a more complicated imp implementation of that neural network is called deep learning. So we're going to be learning about that as well. And finally, we're going to move on to the topic that um, I specialize in, which is psychographics. So on to our first section, which is machine learning and AI. And the term rabbit hole actually comes from the movie Matrix. I don't know if um, you're too young to be uh, to have seen that movie, but it was a very inspiring one, uh, kind of a sci-fi uh, movie where you could actually teleport to different um, parts um, of the computer program, uh, fighting with um, humans, and it's a very interesting concept. You should really watch it. So when we talk about machine learning, one might ask, why is that called machine learning? when both are done through computers. And by definition, computer is a machine. So if both ways are to teach machines, then why one is called rule-based learning and another is called machine learning. Now, it's not the machine that we talk about, rather how the same machine learns in two different ways. And that's the topic um, of our um, conversation today. And one is dependent on you for the most part, because you have to teach all the instructions to the machines so that machine simply has to follow the instructions. So to put it in a very simple way in which you can explain to a sixth grader, two plus two is four. That is how you're going to lay it out for the machines. So you give them inputs, you can tell them how to actually up, um, do some operation on that input, and then you will finally find the result. But everything you have to do it yourself. Now, how is that different from machine learning? So what machine learning does is that you simply have to give machine an input and the ground rules of the game. And then it's machine's job that to find different permutations and ways to get the output that you're expecting from your input. Now, when you do that, you save a lot of work because you only have to teach machines once how to find rules to get the output that you require. And the rest of it is a machine's job for, for you know, forever as long as it works. And that has become the ground rule and the groundbreaking discovery um, in, in a way that a lot of other inventions are based upon that. Now, it sounds very simple, but how does it actually work in real life? So, this is a classical mathematical problem, and it's a cube, and it's called the Rubik's Cube, if you don't already know that. And the Rubik's Cube is a 3D combinational puzzle invented in 1974 by a Hungarian sculptor and professor architecture, Erno Rubik. Um, it was actually called Magic Cube when it was invented um, and it was sold um, to a company in 1980. And Rubik's Cube won the 1980 German Game of the Year Special Award for the best puzzle. And until 2009, 350 million cubes were sold worldwide. And it's the world's best selling puzzle game um, and best selling toy. Now, there are many ways you can solve that. Um, as you might have figured, there are six um, sides of the cube, and every side has nine distinct subfaces. Now, your job is to make all the faces of same color on each side. Now, with that done, um, how you do that is that you have a set of instructions, and you can find multiple instructions to solve the Rubik's Cube online, but that is one of them. So first you actually have, um, you don't touch the central face of the, um, the central subface of the face that you're trying to solve. And then you um, work on other layers uh, from the bottom. And once all the layers are the same, then you make a cross on the top and then you step-by-step step turn it into a solved Rubik cube. Now, it sounds like a very interesting problem, but how do you teach a machine to solve that problem? 
That's a good question. Now, turns out that it has already been done by a very innovative company called OpenAI, which Microsoft has recently purchased, and it was one of the pioneers of a lot of breakthroughs um, in machine learning. Now, what it does is that um, it trained a pair of neural networks that we're going to be studying about um, shortly to solve the Rubik's Cube with a human-like robot hand. The neural networks are trained entirely in simulation. So there was no physical component of that. So using the reinforcement learning code with a technique called automatic domain randomization. Don't worry about the bigger words um, for now. You know, we're going to explain that in the future. And that means the system can also handle situation it never saw during the training. And that was a groundbreaking solution because that also meant that it can solve physical word problems requiring unprecedented dexterity. So if, if a robot arm can learn to solve the Q problem, it can definitely learn to solve a lot of other problems. Now, all you have to do is to give that robot hand or any machine for that matter, a target. We often call it the ground truth. And the job for the machine learning algorithm is to find that ground truth um, and train it to achieve that goal through minimizing loss. Now, what is a loss? A loss is actually the difference between the target that you're expecting the machine learning algorithm to achieve and what it currently has. So do you remember the example that I gave you about two, two plus two is equal to four? So how do we actually come up with the output four? So let's suppose instead of two plus two, we give it two plus a one. So that means the answer would be three. Um, but what we wanted was, was four. And if you want to find out the loss function, so what we do is we subtract the input or the results of two pl plus one from the target, which was four. So four minus three becomes one, and that's the loss. But so the next time what we do is we increase the number from one to two, and then it would be four. And then when, when we minus four minus four, that would be zero. And that means that we don't have any loss and we have achieved the target um, function. And that is um, such a groundbreaking invention that you might think, how, how, how is that something that has changed um, a lot of things the way we perceive it? But what it actually means is that, that putting very, very little effort, we can actually put everything on machines to learn by themselves and not having to worry about typing all the instructions to that. Now, what were the milestones in AI that we have achieved after we have found out this principle. So this is the first one where there's a computer called Deep Blue by IBM. Um, it played a pair of six games with a world champion at that time, Gary Kasparov, who was a grandmaster. And it played six games. And the first match was played in Philadelphia, uh, which Kasparov won, by the way. And the second game was played in New York City in 1997, uh, which actually a computer won over Kasparov. And that was the first time ever that a computer has won a match against a human being. And that was designed to learn by itself by playing the game again and again and over and over again. So it learns from it not only its own mistakes, but the opponent's mistakes also. Now, another example. In 2011, um, IBM Watson uh, created a Jeopardy supercomputer, uh, which defeated its opponent in a quiz competition. So um, the opponents for the Jeopardy supercomputer was Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter, which were the champions of the quiz game until then. But in the final round, um, finally, Watson beat its opponents by a bigger margin. But that's not the whole picture because Watson got some of the questions which were very obvious wrong. And that was um, kind of a challenging moment, but the triumph of AI was the fact that human beings can be beaten through computers and computer can think intelligently. Now, one of the recent um, victories of AI or computer is 
a game that's called Go, and that's played in South Korea. Um, so it has a chess-like board, but you play it with black and white beats, and it's a very complicated game. So one of the most in innovative companies in AI domain is called DeepMind Technologies, which Google has um, purchased um, for quite some time now. Um, it developed an algorithm it's called AlphaGo, and it's also a documentary on Netflix. So if you want to go and see the movie, it's a very interesting one also. Um, so what AlphaGo did was that um, it used um, a Monte Carlo tree search algorithm to find its move um, based on the knowledge that it has gained from not only playing with itself, but also observing the games by other people. And it became so good that after the competition, um, there are other variants um, which are sometimes known as Alpha Go Zero um, and Mu Zero, which have learned to beat humans um, in itself without being taught any rules. And these discoveries are not uh, small. For a computer scientist and for someone in the field, um, it is unbelievable the amount of um, sophistication and deep thinking it requires to actually be able to train um, these machine learning algorithms to find out what humans are thinking and finding out two or three steps ahead of them. Now, how does it actually benefit us? What are some of the practical implications of having these systems um, up and work up and running? Now, one of the things is called self-driving cars um, and trucks. So if you can teach a um, machine to beat other player in AlphaGo or win a quiz competition or beat a human being in chess, so imagine what it can do. Um, approximately 1 by 3 million people die each year as a result of road traffic crashes. That's a huge number. And 93% of the world's fatalities on the roads occur in low and middle income countries, even though these countries have approximately 60% of the world's vehicles. Now, there are a lot of reasons why these accidents happen. It could be on the driver's side, it could be driving under influence or sleepiness um, or misjudgment um, or car brake failures, things like this. It could be on unexpected circumstances also like weather or an animal coming out of the blue, a lot of things. But these mistakes only happen because there's a human element to it. So what if we replace that with an intelligent car that drives itself with electrical power and is sensible enough to keep its lane, do the right turns, and protect human beings. So it turns out that it's possible, and not only is it possible, it has become a huge success with companies like Tesla, which are now um, producing electric vehicles with autonomous driving capabilities. Um, we also have a Chinese rival called NIO. And what if the autonomous driving can be actually extended not only to cars, but truck driving also. So one of the most expensive um, part of the trucking industry is to actually take care of um, truck drivers who are on the road for a long, long time. Um, they are tired and it costs a lot of money and you know the truck safety is also a problem. So there's a recent IPO of uh, one of the largest and highest paid IPOs in the history um, for a company called Rivian, which is a trucking company. Now, with that said, that means we can teach computers to learn a lot more things than just driving. Now, what are some of the other applications? So imagine you have a factory and in that factory, you're trying to optimize the productivity um, and the system design in a way that costs little and it performs the best. And to do those experiments, you either have to physically do that, or you can create a replica of the whole system. And if you have the replica of whole system, it becomes very easy for machine learning algorithms to try to find the best and optimal way to find the best um, workflows and processes. And so NVIDIA Omniverse um, is an ex easily extensible 
open platform built for virtual collaboration and real-time physical accurate simulations. And creators, designers, searchers, and engineers can connect major design tools, assets, and products to collaborate and iterate in a shared virtual space. So what more we can do? A lot of time is spent each day, um, each week, each month traveling on the road. There are truck jams, there are traffic jams, there are red lights, there are accidents, and that cuts a lot of um, transportation in the middle. So what if there is a way where we could actually use drones for human transportation instead of cars? Now, um, the Velocity um, EV toll um, is a um, drone that is aimed to transport human beings in an urban setting. And that's um, alleged to be actually used for Paris Olympics in 2025. And what it does is that it skips traffic jams and detours, and it's optimized for advanced predictable mobility. And it, it's one of the pioneers for electrical urban air mobility and it brings you the ecosystem of whole air taxis and heavy lift drones. What else? This might be interesting actually. Um, this ad has gone really viral um, in past a couple of weeks. Um, and this is actually a part of not just a, a Cadbury ad campaign um, that aims to promote local stores um, in India. Uh, so what they did is that the, through a series of videos on the social media handle, Cadbury explained the latest initiative to help local stores in India that was severely impacted due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So they used machine learning to create Shah Rukh Khan's face and voice. And you could simply use that voice and face to market your own shop, your own brand, your own services. And all of that was made possible by using machine learning and AI. Now, one might think that there could be other applications if that is possible, and that certainly is possible because the person that you see on the screen at the moment, there, there is no such person um, and there, the picture is totally artificial. So what it does is that the algorithm learns the weights and um, features in a human face, and then it mixes and matches different faces. And it's a there's a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. So you can simply go there and create a new face, which simply does not exist. So now we are freeing our mind to find out different possibilities of what AI can do. And that doesn't really end here. Now, 3D billboards um, are used in different um, cities around the world, different metropolises, Tokyo, Paris, London, um, San Francisco. And it's used, um, it, it's employed, um, it employs a principle called a depth of field, uh, which creates visually appealing messages that resonate with the audience more than the flat 2D designs. And you can actually create your own um, 2D image into a 3D image using machine learning. Uh, if you go to a website called Homely, dot AI, um, simply upload your picture and it's going to create a 3D version of that. Now, the neuroscience evidence and depth of field is very clear. We have distinguished impact of dreams um, versus the 2D image by our sensory behavior. Um, so what it does is that 3D images create a whole new level of engagement with the audience resulting in millions and millions of dollars. So what more? So not only can we do a lot of things with images, we can certainly do a lot of things with our uh, bodies as well. So um, this is a picture of uh, a professor called Gil Weinberg, which is a professor at Georgia Tech Institute of Technology. And he works um, on AI built for robotics and music. And um, in this YouTube series on future of AI, if you actually go and um, see this episode, so what he does is that he helped an amputee who's um, lost his arm in an accident um, with a bionic arm. And the core idea is to use a bionic arm to replace the amputated part and connect it with the nerves of the remaining body. Upon neuronal activity from the upper body, bionic arms learn through machine learning what part of the arm 
the body wants to move and it does that with remarkable accuracy. So it looks just like an extension of your real body, only except it's prosthetic. It's not a real arm. Um, but through machine learning, you can find out what your body wants to do on your prosthetic arm. What more can be done? So Dr. Greg Gage is arguably one of the most influential neuroscientists and amazing educator when it comes to brain computer interfaces. Um, his TED Talks are watched millions of times online. And I've had the distinct pleasure of having him on my podcast, where we talked about some of his research and work in neurotech education. Um, so what he does is that he makes brain computer interface. And in this particular TED Talk, what he does is that he connects his arm um, with an arm from a person in the audience and to a brain computer interface. And through brain computer interface, you can actually move the arm of other person through your arm. So basically what it does is that it takes your neuronal activity and transfer it to someone else's body. And that's a very interesting argument. He is also a CEO of a company called Backyard Brains that manufactures BCIs, which is brain computer interfaces for neurotech education in different schools. And feel free to actually go to my YouTube channel and listen to my podcast with him. A very interesting conversation um, and a super fun guy. So what more? We can also use machine learning and AI in different variables in healthcare. So for example, if you're a doctor and if you want to monitor the applications of different doses um, that you're prescribing to your patients. And if you find out the efficacy, like if it's working or not, what you do is that you first give them standard dose and find out um, their results. And then you give them 10% of the dose, like increase it or minimize it, or you're doing some other mixture of that. And you can sub do the group experimentation uh, and find out which works the best. You can also do that with the Apple Watch, um, which now has the stress monitor. Uh, so if you're stressed or not, if you have had enough sleep, uh, what is your heart rate? Um, to the point where, okay, where you're actually thinking about um, an artificial heart. So if you think about heart, it's just a um, pumping machine. So it's no more than that. And if your actual heart fails, you can replace it with an artificial one. And the longest we have known someone to be on an artificial heart is about four years. And that wasn't the best of their product as well. So with the help of AI and machine learning, there's a hope to actually transplant the whole heart um, from a person whose heart's not working and replace it with an artificial one, uh, which hopefully will keep the people alive for a lot longer and a lot happier. Now, what else? Let's talk about agriculture. Um, a lot of money is wasted every year um, by spraying pesticides um, in different agriculture products, which is not precise. It's not accurate. So you sometimes miss the parts where you actually have to do that. Sometimes you don't remember where you have to put how much, and that creates a lot of problems. Now, precision pesticide spray um, uses drones, which leads to gridded results and insight into agriculture growth and productivity. That's probably the most familiar example that we use. Um, chatbots, if you have an Android phone, you can use Google Assistant. If you have an Apple one, you can use Apple Siri. Then you have Amazon Alexa. Um, you can also incorporate those worst instructions um, in different house safety features like Google Nest. Um, set temperatures. If you have a connected house, you can turn on and off your lights, um, your heating systems, your garage, and a lot of other things. And recently, we have got something um, called Copilot um, by OpenAI, which is um, a, a language-based programming um, tool that helps you write different codes just by writing what you want in plain English. And OpenAI's Copilot actually helps you write the code. So you being programmer, that might be a great help. Um, I got the invitation as an influencer quite early uh, when um, they launched the beta version for that. Um, but now it's open for uh, through API for most developers. You should definitely um, try one of them. So let's recap what we have learned so far. 
difference between um, machine learning and the rule-based learning, which is also known as deterministic learning. We also learn how machines learn through loss functions. Um, you get the loss function by subtracting the input from the target and then finding out um, how much do we still have to lose before we actually get the target. Then we also learn about milestones in machine learning, the chess games, the Go game, um, and then the quiz competition, Jeopardy, IBM Jeopardy, and then finally some applications of AI. Now, how does actually computer do that? That's an interesting part. And how does the math behind it works? So there are different algorithms that actually govern all these um, discoveries, inventions, and innovations. And that's a very brief summary of how the math behind some of these algorithms work. Now, don't be too worried about if you don't understand all the terminologies and terms. Just simply remember the basic concepts um, of supervised and unsupervised learning. And I think it's very obvious from the graphic itself that um, if you have the values for the target variable, so let's talk about um, the picture that was on the top um, of the front, uh, the first slide about cats or dogs. So, but you have to find out uh, if the image that you are inputting into a program is a cat or a dog. So what it does that you have already labeled all the images, cats and dogs, um, and then you put it into a machine learning algorithm to find out um, that the input picture that you have just given to the program, is it a dog or is it a cat? And that's called supervised because you have labeled all the images. But in another um, scenario, we do have some random pictures and you give it to the program where the program itself has to figure out that, that it has to learn from patterns that it hasn't seen before. So it essentially teaches itself to find differences between the input. Next on. Forget about deep learning uh, at the moment because we have a complete section on deep learning. Moving on, we have optimization. So if you have different available options or choices in solving a problem, let's say if you're optimizing the search um, function for a website or let's say for a knowledge base um, or a FAQ, what is the best way to organize that information or optimize the performance of the algorithms. So for that, you would use some, something called minimum and maximum um, optimization. Now, again, the classification is used um, in algorithms where you have to classify the information in the different um, classes that you already know. So for example, if you um, have a disease um, and you have information about that disease. So you give it out to algorithm. It has to find out that based on your symptoms or inputs, which disease um, do you have the likely, most likely your, you, uh, you can have based on the features. Now regression is um, simply an extrapolation of the series that you already have. So for example, if you have a record of the month um, the sales um, figures, the uh, location, um, the, um, the product type, um, and different other features, and you want to predict the sales for next month based on that, that would be one example of regression. And that would be the, the simplest one. There are other different kinds. Um, there could be a time series regression as well. But for the most part, that would be an example of regression. And that we can do through machine learning as well. Then you have multi-group uh, experiments also where you create different groups. Um, we just talked about um, a doctor giving different doses um, to different patients to find out the efficacy. That would be one um, example of experimentation. And then you have anomaly detection. Um, now, a very good example of um, anomaly detection would be to finding out fraud cases um, in online payment systems. So if, if, if there is a stolen credit card um, or if the, the usage pattern is very different for the normal transactions, then the system would flag it as an anomaly. And based on that, you can then find out if that's a legitimate transaction or not. And that's used in big data to find out um, if the transactions are legitimate or not. Now, 
what are the algorithms that we actually use to solve these problems? And I can only talk about some of them because of the time constraint, um, but let's get started with the first one, which is the genetic algorithm. And it is one form of solving the optimization problems. And one of the classical problems in machine learning um, using genetic algorithms is called a knapsack problem. So for example, if you have a backpack and you have five items in that backpack, let's say a book, um, a ruler, um, a pencil, um, a lunchbox, um, or let's say a sweater or something. Now you can only put three items in the bag, not all five of them. What is the best way based on the importance of these items to find out the top three most important items that you would put in the knapsack. And that optimization problem can be solved in um, a genetic algorithm form where you will do the evaluation of the current, um, the, the total items, and then you make the selection, then you do a crossover and mutation, which, is, which are terms that comes from um, biology and genetics. And then based on different outcomes, and you will find out the best possible solution for that. Now, the second option is the time series um, right next to it, where you have series based on time. So is the value overall going up or down for a stock? So uh, the greatest example of uh, time series forecasting and basic application of time series forecasting is in stock exchange um, and day trading. So these series actually tells you the overall trends um, and then you have to use different methods to find out if this trend is going to continue or not based on historical patterns. Now, another way um, to solve this problem is called a decision tree. Now, decision tree is a fairly simple one. So if you want to use a ridiculous example that if you have a job and you have an option to, to actually accept the offer or not, you can make a simple flow chart. So for example, if the salary is, um, let's say 50,000 rupees, um, if that's acceptable um, to you, uh, or, or that's, let's say it's at least 50,000, then you would say yes, and then you go to the next one. If no, then you decline the offer. And at the next step, if um, it's too far from your house, it takes a really, really long time to get to that place, um, you probably would like to say no, because you know that's not feasible. And then you decline the offer. But if it's less than that, um, then you find out if you have free food or not, because if that might be an important thing for you to decide about a job, if that's a possibility and you get a free food, you say yes, or you say no. So you see the patterns and you convert your whole decision making into yes and no based on the things that are important to you or not. And machine learning actually learns from the pattern that if that's an optimal solution to the problem or not. And then we have something called support vector machines, which is also a classification or dimensional reduction uh, problem in which we divide uh, different features um, in a way where you have the maximal margin um, in between these two neighborhoods to find out um, the best way to classify um, different uh, disease. For example, if you have, uh, let's say, a heart, um, uh, heart arrhythmia or a heart problem, or let's say you have um, a joint ache and you have data for both of these uh, problems. So how do you classify people who have um, heart arrhythmia and the joint problems? Um, just a hypothetical example. So one of the ways to find out and classify different uh, people in these two different classifications applications is support vector machines. Now I'm not going to go into detail in how that works, but just for now, it's really important to just remember that, you know, these are some of the possible algorithms that, that you actually use. So we talked about the applications of AI, different use cases. Now we were talking about how do we actually, well, what is the maths behind these innovations and discoveries? And that's a very, very, very brief summary of um, the mathematics behind these innovations. Now quickly, let's do a recap of uh, the methods that we learn. The types of machine learning, we learn about um, the supervised and unsupervised learning, um, optimization, 
a regression classification. And then we also learned about different algorithms like genetic algorithms, um, tree-based classification, support vector machines, forecasting, uh, time series forecasting. Um, and that's only a few of uh, what is used in machine learning and AI in general. Now, the most important and interesting part, neural network networks and deep learning. Now, before we actually begin, one must wonder why is it called neural networks? And the idea is that it comes with um, that will, the reason why it's called neural network that it is designed um, based on um, human brain. So every one of us um, were born with at least 100 billion brain cells, and these are called neurons. And as you listen to the talk um, or practice something, um, some sports, or learn a new activity, or watch a movie or anything that you're learning for the first time. So your fibers uh, called dendrites grow out of your neurons. So if you look at these spiky ends of the cell, um, these are called dendrites. And when learning is built, as your network of dendrites grow higher and higher with new dendrites sprouting from existing dendrites. So as you learn um, new skills, the number of dendrites actually increase. In other words, you're building a new knowledge upon the things you already know, like a tree sprouting twigs um, from existing branches. So you know, it grows more and more branches, more and more leaves. And growing your dendrites takes time and practice in real life, like if you talk about the human brain. When two dendrites grow closer, chemical or electrical messages can be sent from one neuron to another through the contact point between the dendrites and called synapse. Now, how does that actually apply in computer science? So that was one of the first attempts to actually build um, a computer um, architecture based on the human brains. Um, as you see, it was, wasn't a very successful attempt um, in 1959. Um, it was called uh, Mark I. And uh, it seems like, you know, the every neuron was connected to every other neuron in that particular implementation of that, which isn't a very smart idea because not all neurons are connected to all neurons in the brain. So there is a certain hierarchy through which you get from one neuron to other neuron in the brain and not all of them are connected. However, in computer sciences, you can do that, which is called the dense layer. Now, how do we get to this point? Um, where we actually really have the to think about um, computer systems as human brain. Now that was an easy journey, um, even though deep learning uh, made it only recently to the mainstream media, its history actually dates back to the early 1940s with the first mathematical model of an artificial neuron by McCulloch and Pitts. It was a very simple one. Um, don't worry about a lot of jargon in that, like adjustable weights and thresholds and XR problems. Um, right now, just focus on the fact that you know it took us took us quite some time to get there. Actually, um, there's a book written called Perceptrons um, by some of the early pioneers, um, in which they argue that it's a very useless task to think about computer networks as human brains. And through that idea, there was a long um, dark age in the research, uh, which is also known as AI winter, where there was no discoveries made and no efforts were actually made. Now, what does it actually mean to have a neural network in computers today? Back to our first image. So, what you do is, um, ideally, when you train a neural network, you have different images. Now, let's make it a little bit more interesting. For some reason, let's say you go to a wedding, it's your family wedding or, a, or another event or anything, and you have 5,000 images from that wedding for some reason. I don't know, people love to have pictures these days. You know, I cannot find any pictures of my family weddings um, where you have that many pictures. But anyways, for some reason, you have 5,000 pictures. Now that's quite a daunting task for you to find out 
out of those 5,000 images, which ones are yours? And there are, are numerous ways to do that. And one of them is certainly um, to use neural networks if you don't want to manually do that. And what it does that, it finds out the features of your face and then matches it with all the pictures that you feed um, the neural network to, and then find out the probability of finding you in that image, and then you know sort out and classify those images that it thinks um, contains you. If you have a MacBook, um, which I do, um, there's a fantastic app called uh, MacBook's Photo App. And as soon as you upload your pictures in that, it would automatically find out um, different people. And if you label them, then it will certainly sort out different people in those pictures. And then um, your jobs becomes a lot more easier. So if we can actually do that, um, how did we actually get here? Now, that's a long story. Um, but this is generally um, the process of finding out the best and fastest and biggest models in recent development of deep neural networks. Um, a lot of re different researchers used different parameters to find out the best suitable way, which is not only uh, very efficient, so it doesn't take a lot of um, time and space complexity. It's um, the accuracy is good as well as it's deployable. So don't worry about the names um, or the the number of parameters. What's important is to understand that with each coming day, the chances of finding out a better model, a faster model, um, is becoming a reality, and that is only due to the fact that now we have um, fastest compute power, we have faster memories, we have uh, data centers and cloud architectures that we can use to leverage. And we're going to be studying about what that actually might mean. But before that, um, cats and dogs, how do we actually find out cats and dogs or your picture from your grandma's pic uh, picture or your brother's picture or your nephew's picture? How does computer actually know that that's you in the picture. And to talk a little bit about the maths, um, there are some functions that we use in neural networks that gives us a probability of you having in a picture. Now, don't worry about the mathematical notations and expressions. What you need to know is that uh, if you look at the first one, sigmoid, which is the most used in the classification problem is that it's, um, it's between zero and one, and the likelihood of you being in the picture lies in between that zero and one. And the more it's towards one, it's more likely that you are in the picture and the computer is going to let you know that you are in this picture, or at least suggest that, you know, is that you in the picture? And that's how it finds out um, the classification of all the images that you give them. Now, more importantly, what are the applications beyond finding your pictures in neural networks? Now, that's an example that you use every single day. And today is the day where you're going to find out how your Uber ride or your in-drive ride works. So that is one certain implementation of neural network, which is called graph neural networks. So for example, if you take an Uber right now and you go to another part of city, so what it does is that all the rides on the road at the moment, they are certainly connected to each other by time and space. So if you book a ride, it gives you an estimated time of arrival for your driver, let's say five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. How does it actually calculate that? So what it does that, you know, it coordinates with all the other coordinates or the cars um, or traffic uh, milestones and find out that how long does it actually take this car to get there? And it does a very complicated um, computation and then gets you the ETA for that. And all of that is done through something called graph networks, um, which is based on the idea that all nodes in a network are connected to each other in a certain spatial dimension. And this is one way that you can apply neural networks. And the difference between 
you must be confused what what is a deep neural network or what is what is a neural network. So deep neural network is nothing but a more complicated neural network. So if you have more than one layer, two, three, four layers, it's called deep neural network. So that's the only difference. That's not something special. And one of the implementation of that is graph neural networks. I actually had a fantastic researcher on my podcast called Ankit Jain, who worked at Facebook, and he previously worked at Uber um, and worked a lot on these graphic learning models. And, and if you're interested in that, you should certainly check that podcast. I also had the creator of the library called uh, PyTorch Geometric, which is a PyTorch implementation of um, graph libraries. And he's also now working with Stanford's um, OGB um, which is the Open Graph Benchmark Datasets Initiative. Um, that's an interesting conversation also if you are interested in that. Now, with that said, not everything is simple in life. Um, it takes a lot of problems um, to get to the result stage. And one of them is the compute power. Now, the reason why we need GPUs to do these computations um, in parallel is that because there are a lot of lot of computations. So the permutations um, of a certain algorithms are in the order of magnitude or in the magnitude of order. And it costs about $10,000 to actually buy one of these NVIDIA V100 GPUs. I think it's a 32 GB variant. And one of the largest language models that has been trained um, is called GPT-3, which had 175 billion parameter models, uh, I'm sorry, parameters. Um, and Microsoft generally generously offered a whole cluster of these GPUs. And the estimated cost of that was around 10 to $12 million, which is probably more than the whole education budget of Pakistan. And now the question remains that if it's not financially feasible, is that worth it to actually learn data science or um, deep learning for that matter? And the answer is that the picture is not as bleak as you think it is. There are huge advancements in individual GPUs also. Um, and GPUs are getting faster for smaller and moderately intense tasks. So the GPU that I am using is the Apple M1 um, GPU, which is recently launched, um, and it has a 16 core neural engine, which would be enough for um, a lot of your computer requirement for small and moderate data tasks. And luckily, you don't have to train the bigger um, billion parameter models on your own. You only have to develop the proof of concept of proof of value to different organizations, and you'd be surprised how many people would be willing to pay for um, your compute resources and powers. Um, a lot of my students have um, actually gotten scholarships in US in other places um, where they got to actually find the compute power and sponsorship for their models. And that's a good part of that. You only need to learn the core skills of how to do things. And you would be surprised how many people would want your skills. Now, with that said, there are still GPUs um, the GPU ecosystem by NVIDIA is the most favorable one because of its um, CUDA ecosystem, different libraries and SDKs. Um, and that's probably the most used ones. Now, a quick recap of what we know. Uh, neural networks are based on human brains. We have 100 billion neurons and neural networks is our attempt to actually replicate that into computer sciences. We also learn about history of evolution of neural networks with Michalik and Rosenblatt's Mark I um, onwards. We also learn about neural network architectures with so AlexNet, ResNet, um, and others. And finally, we talked about some of the challenges in neural networks based AI, the GPUs, um, rising costs, um, and what you can do individually. Now, on to the final part of the presentation, which is my area of special expertise, which is called psychographics. Now, before we actually move on, we need to find out what psycho and graphics um, means. Now, psychology 
um, has lent the first part of uh, the word psycho, uh, which becomes the um, prefix for the terminology. And the graphics is um, the number part of that. So psychographics actually means the behavioral explanations of why people do things that they do. Now, I will have a graphic to differentiate between demographics and psychographics soon, but for now, that's all you need to know. But how do we actually find out what people like or people do not like? Well, there appears it, it appears that there are three ways you can find out how people behave or what they're thinking. Now, one is the simple survey data. So if I give you a survey about your food choices, I can ask you, what do you like? Do you like ice cream? Do you like pizza? Do you like um, oriental food? Do you like fatty foods? Are you into burgers? Uh, do you like sausages? And you, know, you fill out that form and you give it back to me. And then once I have so many forms, you know, I can put that into a computer system. I can find out your choices. Now it's suitable for academic settings. Like in class, if you do a survey, that's possible. Um, it, you can also do to the list um, limited customer feedback. So for example, if everyone on Facebook started uh, filling out different forms, everyone will be bored and they won't, they will be stop, they will be stopping the usage of Facebook. So that's not a good solution. So we can see that it's, it's a low response rate um, and low sample size research. Now, the other way is that instead of asking people what they want, we can find out by their behavior what they're doing online. Um, so if someone's using Facebook, um, which a billion people probably are, um, they generate user activity. So which friends you're connecting to, which pages you're connecting to, um, who are you more interested in? How much time do you spend on Facebook? Is it the nighttime, is it the daytime? Um, what age you are? So the, that's something the that Facebook knows when you actually use the data. And that data is in huge volumes um, because we use Facebook a lot. And then you have activity and preference data also. So for example, you want to follow someone or you don't want to follow someone, um, you're commenting on the page more or less. So that's your preference data that Facebook actually knows. And you use it on multiple devices. And you can collect behavior data from edge devices like sensors um, that are on different instruments to find out the temperature, humidity levels and everything. You also use um, and generate data from mobile devices. Then you have variables like Apple Watch, Android Watch, um, Fitbits, and then you certainly have your good old desktop. Um, and you also provide data through API. Now, finally, a very small set of data is generated through neuroscience data experiments. And that's a very tough one because the sample sizes are very slow. So that means that every time I want to find out uh, what your, um, you want to have for food, instead of asking you, I put a headset on your brain um, and then connect it to a computer and then find out your brain activity and then find out if you want a pizza or you want a Coke. And even then, it's, it's not a very clear neuronal activity that differentiates between a pizza and a Pepsi. So um, it's used for a very small um, set of um, experimentations in a very expensive labs um, that study memory and sleep um, and cognition and other things. And um, it's not very replicable and scalable. So that means you cannot have hundreds and thousands and millions of people um, through which you can have neuroscience data because it you know, costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time and it's very hard to interpret and expensive. Now, <clears throat> what do we know from all this information? So first thing, there are two kinds of information um, that you can find from people. One is the demographics, which is information about you that does not change. For example, your age, it's, it's not like your age is 16 today, so it's going to be 17 tomorrow, and it's going to be 13 uh, the other day. So that's something that remains the same. Um, how much you earn, that remains same at one point in time. So it does not fluctuate within a day. Um, your profession, that doesn't change every day. Um, your spouse, your family member, that doesn't change. So anything that does not change can be categorized into demographics. Now your choices in life and preferences are called psychographics. So hopefully now I make it very clear. So if you like to play a hockey, um, 
rugby, football, badminton, that's a personal choice. And that can be counted towards your psychographics. And the kind of holidays do you want to have? Do you want to go to a um, hilly place? Do you want to go to a desert? Do you want to go um, on ice-capped mountains? Um, are you good with money or not? How much you spend on ads? How much you spend on clothes? Um, do you have any pets? Uh, do you like music? Um, do you have any hobbies? These are some of the behavioral preferences that can be classified as psychographics. Now, what does that actually tell you about personality? Now, it turns out that human beings are a lot more predictable than most people think that they are. And one of the oldest and most reliable ways to find that out uh, is the big five personality test. So one might wonder what are the key features through which people differentiate themselves from others. Now, for example, what is the difference between me and you? Maybe the color, the height, um, the width, the length, the body fat, uh, the muscular structure, um, the uh, genetics, a lot of things. But what is, there's another difference, which is more of a psychographic difference. So you might like hockey, I might like um, soccer, um, you might like ice cream, I might like uh, burgers. So that's a psychographic difference. And when you talk about psychographic difference, these temperamental differences can be divided into five big domains, as the big five suggest. And one of them is openness to experience. Other is called conscientiousness, which is persistence in a job. And then there's introversion and extroversion, like you like to be with a lot of friends or do you like to be, uh, to be with small circle of um, loyal and old friends? How agreeable you are, do you use prefer to sacrifice your choices um, to help others or do you prefer yourself and you are very self-interested? Or, and, and then finally neuroticism, which should be actually called emotional stability. That means that um, do you panic uh, in stressful situations or you feel relaxed? Now it turns out that this small knowledge can actually predict human personality in a lot bigger way than you can probably think. And one of the research papers that uh, can be considered as groundbreaking in that um, field is the computer-based personality judgments um, that turned out to be better than humans. And it was a paper um, in collaboration with Facebook and um, Cornell. And it turns out that if you know 150 like history from a person and their personality type, you can predict them better than their coworkers. If you know 300 likes from that person, you can predict them better than their spouse. And if you know 500 likes from that person, you can know them better than themselves and you can predict what their next move would be. Now, it turns out uh, Mihai Kosinski, who was the author of that paper, uh, when he submitted that paper into the journal, the reviewer of um, that uh, paper was Ryan Sherman, who is a good friend of mine, and he was on my podcast, and we talked about that paper. And you might think that it, it, it's a very groundbreaking discovery, but you know, people in the field of personality psychology, they have known it for at least two or three decades now. Um, the computer isn't doing anything that humans can't do. It's just the scale at which it does that matters, and the insights is able to offer is a lot bigger than human beings because you can judge a person if you lived with them, if you stayed with them, if you have information about them uh, for the most part, but you cannot do it for a million people at the same time because you have a certain capacity to process information. Computers do not have this limitation. And that is the holy grail um, of prediction uh, when it comes to large scale prediction of human personality. Now, there are different tools that you can actually use for that. Um, some are commercial, some are um, amateur, and some are clinical. Um, so one of them is called Neo PI3. That would be more clinical tool. Then you have Hogan's, which actually focuses on um, recruitment and um, leadership development. Then you have Pymetrics, which is the gamification version of that. And then you have MBTI, which is a free version. You can take it online. Um, it's not a scientifically um, evaluated one, um, but it certainly gives very good insights into personality. 
Now, with that said, how do we actually generate insights from that that are useful in business? Well, we have got something called structural equation modeling or path analysis. And that is a multivariate method that we use to test hypothesis about a certain person. For example, I have a hypothesis that every one of you um, who's aged below 20 years old is going to be interested in buying um, a ticket uh, for a cricket match, uh, which is being played in Pakistan and India. So that's my hypothesis. I have no evidence for that. So what I can do is I can gather information uh, from you based on your social media activity, answers, questionnaire, anything. And then I can put it into a structural equation modeling in a way where I could, where I could actually find out that my hypothesis that you're going to buy the ticket is a correct one or not. And can I do the dimensionality reduction based on your answers to find out that there's a correlation between your response and my hypothesis. Now it's a very complicated process and there are different tools available for that, um, like Israel, EQS, Amos, um, and other tools. Um, and recently we also have uh, Smart PLS3, uh, which is an interesting one. Um, but you know, that being said, it's one of the tools that um, you can use. One more thing uh, that we do in social sciences is find out the factor analysis. Now, I just talked about the big five personality tests. How do you actually find out these five big dimensions um, of human personality based on the questionnaire that we give to people? And then based on those items, we find out um, if that person is more open or less compared to other people. So the method that we used to actually find that out is called factor analysis. And in social and behavioral sciences, that's one of the leading um, methods that you use to establish um, the reliability and validity of these items. And we use different tools for that, which is um, exploratory factor analysis and the confirmatory factor analysis. It's a very interesting topic. But to make the point, that's uh, something that you use to find out the reliability of your research. Now, moving on, how do you actually make money from that? Now, it turns out uh, Facebook um, makes 98% of its revenue, not from the Facebook itself, but by the ads that it furnishes when you are using Facebook. And that's the only revenue model that they have. So it, you might think that you know they're making money from the app or your usage pattern um, or some of the features or Facebook's marketplace. That doesn't seem to be true. Now, the same is true for Twitter and same is true for Google. 92% and 94% of that, their revenue comes from the ads. Now, one might ask that, you know, to be able to make so much money from the ads, you must be really, really good in matching the sponsors and the people who would be more interested in your ads. And that is a very tough problem because you have to be very, very good at predicting the kind of customers who would be interested in the sponsored product and they would likely buy it. And it turns out that it is possible and not only is it possible, it's scarily easy to do. Now, one of the tools that you can use to do that is called Facebook Audience Research Tool. And that is how it looks like. So if you go to that page, you can select your demography, um, like your country, the region that you want to um, run your campaign in, then you can select the age, um, gender, different interests, people that you're connected to or pages that are connected to. And then it's going to give you the overall picture of how do people in that genre or category look like. And based on that information, you, you can create an ad that will resonate with the kind of people that you're advertising to. You can also find the page, page likes and location information about such people who would be more interested in your ad. Now, how does actually Facebook do that once you make a Facebook ad? So there's a tool called the Facebook Pixel. So what it does is that you create a Facebook Pixel from within the Facebook, and then you embed that Pixel in different websites. So have you ever imagined that if you're searching for a shoe, so you're in the market for finding a very fancy um, 
formal shoe for the coming wedding. So you go on a website, you search for the shoes, um, you look at some, you don't like it. So you're, you know, close the website and you go to Facebook. And all of a sudden you start seeing the ads for, within the Facebook from different shoe manufacturers. And you are wondering that how does actually Facebook know that, you know, I was searching for shoes. And Facebook actually gets that from the pixel. That is one of the ways. You can also do it from the uh, information sharing and cross cross platform collaboration, different platforms. But one of the ways to do that is through Facebook pixel. Now, with that said, once you know what people are searching, you can certainly target them for the ads that they're looking for. Now at SIDA, what we do is that we create a cutting edge research um, regarding how actually people buy things. What are the purchase patterns? What are the cognitive factors that impact other people's purchase decisions? And turns out um, that political differences are a very good indicator of how people are going, are going to buy things. So if you are on a far left or right, you buy certain brands, the reason why you buy brands are very different. The reasons that matter to you in personal life are very important. So for example, one of the difference between conservatives and liberals is that conservatives want to compete with each other in power and status. Liberals want to compete with each other um, in terms of uniqueness and difference um, and subtlety. And that gives you a lot of insights about how to actually approach these customers. And this is something that turns out to be an information that a, comp that a lot of companies are really, really looking for. Now, let's play an interactive game here. Um, let's make it a little bit of fun. How people actually interact with each other is based on some certain principles. So every single person in your life, be it your parents, be it your friends, um, be it your colleagues, your teachers, you play a game with them, which can be categorized a game theory in which both of you are trying to maximize the benefit from that interaction in a way that is a win-win situation while keeping the relationship. Now, what it means is that um, there's a classical example of how um, around the world faculty teaches game theory, which is called prisoner's dilemma. So let's suppose um, two of your, you and a friend of yours um, is in a prison. I'm not a very good example, but uh, not a fun example, but certainly uh, drives the point home. And now both of you have two options. You are kept in different cells, so you cannot talk to each other. So both of you are given two options. One is that if you um, become a traitor and you rat on your friend and you put all the blame on your other friend, then uh, your friend gets 20 years prison and you get out for free. Now, if both of you um, rat each other out, um, you confess, you get five years each. And if you, if you remain silent, but your friend rats you out, you get 20 years prison. And if you remain silent and your friend remains silent, both of you get one year. Now that's a very complicated question and which solution is the ideal situation in which you would maximize the chances that you are fair and you get the least prison and researchers and thinkers have found out that the best way or the best option to resolve the prisoner's dilemma is for both of you to actually rat each other out and confess that gives you five year prison of each. Now, the reason is that if you kept silent or if your friend kept silent, you could have gotten one year, but that depends on the presumption that your friend will not rat you out, which is probably a possibility, but do you really want to risk that option? So in game theory, what you do is that you maximize your options and you do not leave anything open for chance. And this is the exact principle that you use for interaction when you're buying things, when you have consumer patterns and behaviors going on that you want to predict or you are able to understand. And how does it actually look like 
in how human beings make decisions. So there is a master's hierarchy of need in things. So the basic need is food, shelter, warmth, and security. And then you go up the higher level where you have the security, enough disposable money and income and justice. And then you go a larger one where you want to belong, you want to have a family, friends, um, relationships, um, some, and then you go up with some kind of esteem and fame um, in life. And then finally, there's a self-actualization or growth need where you think about intellectual pursuits or the idealistic or artistic pursuits. And when you're starting a new company or you are selling something, you need to first find out where in this pyramid does your product lie? So if your product is something that gives the essential needs of people to them, like food product, um, or let's say electricity, um, or telecommunication in some way, then you know it's a high demand, uh, or let's say a high importance product. And the people who are going to want that product is everyone. So you your tactics will be different from someone else. So your bargaining uh, position will be different from other products, which let's say are on the upper echelons of the massive hierarchy, let's say self-esteem um, or self-exploitation. Now, how do you decide prices um, that would be acceptable for these people? One would be highly elastic product and other is relatively inelastic product. So what it means is that with the increasing um, amount of quantity, does the price increase or not? And the difference in of the change in quantity demanded, um, what is how is that correlated to the change in price percentage? And that is some of the decisions that you have to make in order to make your product uh, pricing viable. And, um, and these are some of the decisions, only some of the decisions that you have to think in a bigger picture when you're deciding about psychographics and using deep learning to do that. Now, how do you have, we actually mathematically implement that through neural networks? We have different tools for that. And one of them is called Snowplow. So what it does is that it creates um, and centralizes the information that is being generated through your mobile apps, desktop applications, websites, different servers, third-party tools like MailChimp, um, CallRail, Adjust, SendGrid. And what it does is that it cleans and validates and uh, transforms that information so that's in a usable format. It saved that in a data warehouse where it's stored for the future use. Um, and then it also feeds that to your data-driven applications. And then you find finally your data and analytics team can use it um, for um, the predictive modeling. Now, that's where the story gets very complicated. On the academic side uh, of um, the story and the universities, that's where your job actually kind of ends. But on the commercial side, you don't only have to worry about the modeling, you also have to worry about the implementation and the big data stack, how complex that is to actually implement that. And it turns out that the big data um, landscape is growing bigger and bigger and bigger with more sophisticated tools, a lot of tools and a lot of good tools. So in that regard, you have to worry about how do you actually leverage the best tools um, with low cost and highest performance. Do you want to choose a vendor that does um, it easily for you um, and you pay a price for that? Or do you want to use open source? Do you want uh, to pay a lot of money for a lot of performance or you um, want to pay less money for less performance? Um, do you want to operate on a global scale or a local scale? What kind of service do you want to have that? Is it if it's a security sensitive information? Do you want to have that on-prem like locally or do you want to put that on the cloud? Only some of the decisions out of millions of decisions that you have to make every day. And um, if you are the director of engineering of a big corporation and uh, how complicated that is, well, that should give you a picture. So if you have an office and that could be easily any medium sized enterprise around the world. So you have an office in Canberra and Tokyo and Singapore and Delhi, and then you, Frankfurt, London, New York, San Francisco. Now, when your information is being generated, you have to sync it through all the servers in real time, creating data and analytics. You have to do business logics on behind. You have to worry about the clusters, the costs, the architecture. 
and a lot of other things. So it is mind bogglingly hard. And that is why it makes a, such a fascinating career if you are interested in solving these complicated problems. Now, to do a recap, what did we learn today in the presentation? And I'm going to be concluding soon so I can actually take your questions. So we learned about the demographics versus psychographics. We also learned about personality tests and factor structure and how is that actually helpful in making business decisions. How does psychometric help you? And we use the Facebook case study where they can predict human personality based on their likes and then use that personality information to furnish ads that would match with your consumer behavior pattern um, resulting in more sales. And then we have consumer behavior that we studied um, in terms of uh, political um, voting pattern and how does that translate into buying behavior. We also learned about prisoner dilemma and game theory. And we studied about price elasticity, a, a term from economics, and then Maslow hierarchy. Now, with that said, um, the reason why I do a lot of these conferences um, and presentations and webinars is not because I wanted to teach you deep learning and big data and science. Um, it's because um, machine learning and AI, it, it's a lifelong pursuit of exciting opportunities, tough problems to solve with the hope of building something groundbreaking and life-changing. But while in pursuit of excellence and glory, don't forget to enjoy the ride. Um, find a way to make learning enjoyable, education fun, and university a place where you find friends and happiness. And find a mentor who not only teaches you, but inspires you to be the best version of yourself and pushes you forward. It's, it's university. It's not a win-lose game. Um, for the best product of an education system is kind, intelligent, and curious human beings. And that is the goal worth living. And the picture um, that you're seeing is from one of my classes, um, undergraduate classes, where we actually had a birthday in the class um, of one of my teaching assistants. Um, and it turns out that you know, students learn the best when you find learning you, you make learning enjoyable for them when you have fun, you know, you have the happiness and joy of learning. If you don't have that, you know, college turns into a pressure um, machine that you don't want to be in. So with that, I conclude my talk and uh, I wish you very well with your studies, research um, and anything life brings to you. Um, and for more information, um, you can contact um, us on our company website. You can follow me on LinkedIn and YouTube. Um, you can uh, send me an email. Uh, and hopefully there will be an opportunity when I get to meet you in person uh, very soon in the future. And I thank you so much.